Welcome to Mariner's Church. We're so glad that you're here. And every week, we get together to sing songs of praise, dive into God's word, expecting that the Spirit of God will meet us and minister to us. Let's worship together.
They say this mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like I do Cause there is power in your name And we've heard that there is no This song 
Amen. God is so good. You know, we love our online community. And so if this is your first time at Mariners, or if you've been joining us for a while, but you haven't yet connected with us, I want to invite you into a couple next steps. The first is to sign up for an account. This way you can let us know where you're from or even how we can be praying for you. And another way to connect with us is through the Connect card. This is the best and easiest way that someone here on staff can reach out to you and walk with you through your next steps. Today is also an extended prayer service. And so what that means is that at the end of our service, Jared will invite you into a time of additional prayer. But the beautiful thing about the online community is that you can actually request prayer throughout the service. 
So please do not leave today if you are in need of prayer without receiving prayer from one of our staff or elders. We would love to pray with you. Let's continue to worship together. I was an absolute atheist. There was no way, no how, nobody was ever going to convince me that there was this God or spirit. If I couldn't see it and feel it, it did not exist. After having an experience while in law school where I could not control my destiny, things just did not work out the way I wanted. And therefore, out of desperation, I was sitting in a church and hearing God tell me that he loved me. And at that moment, I knew he was real. I just dug into the word. And the more I dug into the word, the more the Holy Spirit just infiltrated every part of my life. And so my first experience with praying out loud was right after law school. And when I prayed, all those verses that I had been reading just came to mind. In the beginning, it was mostly about my family and the people around me and myself, but I decided to pray for people outside my circle. And doing so exponentially grew my faith and my prayer life. The commitment to prayer, I think, changed the trajectory of my life, the way my walk with Jesus has gone. That is the reason why I now serve at Mariners on the prayer team. It's because I saw how prayer can transform lives. And now it's my privilege every weekend to be able to pray for anyone who comes up. I see God working and it increases my faith. It deepens my knowledge and my walk with God. The very last I Believe service, this young lady came up for prayer. She had just given her life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit was just so strong. And we were both laughing and crying all at the same time. I think we were feeling a little bit of what God was feeling in heaven. And so that's why we were overcome. And that's how the Spirit shows up. Well, hi everyone, my name is Jared and I am so excited to be with you today. Now, if you're like me, you have found yourself in a whitewater rafting scenario. You've been in a rubber boat, handed a paddle and expected to have fun. Think about that just for a minute, right? You, you are in a boat made out of rubber when we have metal ones now. You get handed a paddle to be the engine even though boats have motors now and you are expected in that moment to enjoy yourself. I've gone down some pretty great rivers. I've done parts of Glacier, I've done parts of Colorado. And last summer, I took my family, wanting them to have this experience, down the Weber River outside of Park, uh, Park City. And you can see here in this photo, as we went down the most vicious of rapids that day, the, the thrill factor was at an ultimate high. You can see the terror in our faces as we went down the largest rapid of the day. And in this moment, I'm looking at my family, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to enjoy this, going, look, we're having a great time. And I'm thinking back to some times in my life when I've been down class three and class four rapids, and this is supposed to be fun. Now, the only redeeming factor when you go whitewater rafting is that you're not alone. You are given uh, a river guide who I think might be the most fascinating type of human of all time. Right? If you think about who a river guide is, they always have the mustache, the four strap sandals, the leathered skin, they're eating goji berries and drinking wild honey. They've got a Patagonia from head to toe on. They're telling you stories about how they rode their bike across Iceland last summer. I mean, these guys are unique, right? But what I love about them is that they're in your boat. They don't just say, hey, there's the river, point that direction and I'll see you when you get to the end. They say, we're doing this together. Really, when you think about it, the river doesn't change at all. It doesn't matter whether you have a guide in your boat or not, the river is the same. The rapids are what they are. But the river guide comes with you with all of his experience, his local knowledge. Every river that he has done before comes with him. And as you have that person in the boat with you, you have the chance of enjoying the moment. 
Now, if you think about your life, as I think about mine, it's fascinating to me that in this life, we, if we're honest, have experienced a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles, perhaps even pain in your life. And what's crazy is if you and I added up just in your family or in your neighborhood, if you think about all of the things that your friends have gone through, we would have to admit that life can be pretty scary at times. And it's also interesting if you think about that life doesn't distinguish between Christians and non-Christians. Really what it means is for you today, no matter what you believe about God, life is what it is. And so how are you and I supposed to live in that kind of life? Really the big question I want us to wrestle with today is in the midst of the pain and the struggle of our life, how does God care for you? We're in week three of a series this summer where we're learning about the Holy Spirit. We're learning about who he is and what it means to have a relationship with him. And so today I'd like to share a couple of passages of scripture with you. And we're gonna start in John chapter 14. Now the context of this, te- uh, this, this passage is that Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples on the night that he's going to be betrayed. And he's well aware of it. In fact, even as he shares with his disciples, he predicts his own death, like he knows what's coming. And the disciples look to him and they have concern on their face. They are the ones afraid. They are the ones who are worried. And really they're asking themselves two internal questions. Who is going to take care of us and will we be safe? You see, they've lived this last three years with Jesus alongside them. And while they've been in some pretty precarious situations, Jesus was always there. But now Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave. And those questions well up within them, who will take care of us and will we be safe? John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 say this. These are the words of Jesus. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. You see, Jesus, in the midst of his disciples feeling uncomfortable, he chooses to comfort them, which is a little bit ironic because Jesus, predicting his own death, should be the most uncomfortable person in the room, and yet he chooses to comfort his disciples. And he says a couple of important things there. He says, I will give you another counselor or comforter forever. I love the generosity of Jesus in this moment. I will freely give you. And then he says another. We actually talked about that word a couple of weeks ago. Another meaning one in the same, meaning Jesus has been with them. He's going to give them another just like him. And who is that person going to be? It will be the Holy Spirit the paraclete, the comforter, the counselor, the one who will come alongside them from this point forward, that is forever. You see, Jesus was a temporary physical relationship for them, but the Holy Spirit is going to be the forever companion for the rest of their days. Now, if you and I look at that word today, we we seek this idea of comfort. You see, it's, it's funny to me that when you and I talk about where we're most comfortable, We are thinking about a lazy boy chair. We're thinking about a tub of ice cream. Perhaps it's putting on a Snuggie and some slippers. It's crawling into our bed. Our picture of comfort is this casual, leisure, soft, I'm feeling warm, I'm in my happy place. But what's interesting though, is that that's actually not the definition of comfort in its original form. That, those things that you and I seek after It's not really comfort, it's coping mechanisms. Oftentimes the things that you and I turn to to feel comfortable is actually us coping with the circumstance around us. And and as we think about that picture, there's uh, the word comfort is actually a hybrid of two Latin words. Come being the first part meaning with and fort, which means strength. So the true definition of comfort is not comfortable, it's with strength. So when Jesus says, I will give you another to be with you, what he says is I'm sending someone to be with you in strength, to give you his strength. There's a quote that I I found as I was studying for this passage by a theologian named R.C. Sproul. He says this, 
Sometimes we hear the expression, that's not my forte. When a person says that, he is declaring that he is weak in a certain area. Forte is used popularly as a synonym for strength. In biblical terms, it is the Holy Spirit who is our forte. He is the one whom we derive our strength. So when we are promised a comforter, what we are promised is someone who will be with us in strength. He will be with us to be our strength. Now I'm imagining that many of us, I know this is true for me, that you have had a moment in your life where somebody else has been your strength. When you were down, when you were at a weak point in your life, when you hit your rock bottom, someone came alongside you to be your strength, to prop you up, to walk alongside you through however long it would take for you to experience health and healing again. I also would imagine that many of us have been that for another person. Not only have you received strength from someone, you have been strength for someone. Many of you, I am sure, are right now walking alongside somebody who has experienced job loss. They're going through a relationship struggle, perhaps a a diagnosis that looks bleak. And you are coming alongside them. And sometimes we can feel discouraged as we're walking alongside somebody going through something difficult because we don't have the words to say. We don't have all the answers to their questions. We don't know how to actually help them. But let me encourage you by saying that the very best thing that you can do is to practice the presence that the Holy Spirit does for us, that we can be with them in strength. They're not looking for all the answers. They're just looking for someone to be with them, to be their strength. This is exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. He comes to us when we need him most. Um, As Jesus is even thinking about his disciples and he's promising them another to be with them, he knows that they will need someone with them. He knows that the days are going to be challenging ahead. He knows what the ultimate end will be for every one of his disciples. And what does he choose to do? He sends them another just like himself. The Holy Spirit comforts us, not by making us more comfortable. He sends us his Holy Spirit to be our strength. And so as you and I are even hearing that idea, as we're thinking about that's amazing news that the Holy Spirit comes to us in strength, the the disciples in their day were concerned for their safety. And I would imagine that you and I, we can be concerned today for our own health and well-being. We can be concerned about our financial forecast. We can be concerned about the, the, the state of our country or the things going on around the world. Fear and anxiety can come in and we are promised the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful thing that we are comforted. We are given his strength. But really the question is, what happens after that moment of comfort? You see, the Holy Spirit is not momentary comfort. He is eternal presence with you. And so it's not just that he comes to us in strength. The Holy Spirit reminds us of who we are in God's family. Um, Let me show you a passage that comes out of the book of Romans. Verses 16 and 17 say this, the spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Romans chapters five through eight, I believe are some of the most important passages in the New Testament, perhaps even all of the Bible. It really describes for us the picture of salvation and the beauty of what you and I have in Jesus. And then when you get to chapter eight, it's all about life in the spirit. What does it look like for you and I living today without a Jesus in human form right next to us, What does it look like for us to live a spirit-filled life? And so no matter um, what family of origin you come from, no matter what your, your, your story is of your childhood, there is truth in this passage that says, for those of us who belong in Christ Jesus, we are heirs of God. We are co heirs with Christ himself. We are in God's family. And it also says in there something that might startle some of us. 
You see, it acknowledges that for those of us who are co-heirs with Christ, we will experience struggle. We will experience suffering. None of us is immune to the broken world that we live in. But there is beauty in the reality that when you and I suffer, for those of us who follow Jesus, we do not suffer alone. And in fact, there's a depth to it that says we get to share in Christ's suffering. I know many of you have had a lot of challenging circumstances over the last couple of years. You have been through it and you are barely standing now. And there is something that you know about Jesus that people who have not been through what you have been through, you understand something about him in a unique way because you have shared in his suffering. You see, there is nothing that you have felt that Jesus has not felt as well. And you get to share in what he experienced. And so when we suffer, when we struggle, to be comforted by strength is one thing, but then to be encouraged is another. You see, in your own life, when do you look for encouragement? Encouragement is that thing we look for when we're feeling less than secure in ourself, when our identity is a little bit wavering. You and I will turn to achievements or perhaps people in our life and we will seek out encouragement. We will want to feel better about ourselves. It's normal, right? Uh, I even find myself sometimes a date night with my wife and I'll kind of talk about some stuff and I'll sort of paint a picture of how terrible things are and I'll even make some statements about how kind of insecure I'm feeling and what I'm hoping for, I'm kind of fishing for her to speak life into me. I'm desperate for her my wife to speak truth into my life about who I actually am. We turn towards all kinds of things to be encouraged. Sadly though, many of us turn towards achievement or performance-based things to give us our encouragement. We turn towards our status, the number of followers we have on our social media accounts. We turn towards our portfolio. We look at our job title. We look at our career achievements. We look at even things like the wellness of our own children to make us feel better about ourselves. We turn towards a lot of conditional things to feel a certain way about ourselves. That's a scary kind of encouragement, if we're honest. Because if you take encouragement from a thing that has ups and downs, a thing that can change, sadly, the encouragement you feel will turn from you are something positive to you aren't enough. Anytime you and I seek encouragement from an external factor, something outside of God himself, we put ourselves subject to whatever that thing says about us. You will lose followers on your social media account. You will not always have financial success. You will not always get to enjoy the fruit of your family and, and the health that there is there. It is concerning if our, our encouragement comes from external things. But look at what Jesus is reminding us. In Romans chapter eight, the apostle Paul is telling us the greatest source of encouragement is that the spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. This is a reminder of our own identity. This is a reminder of who you and I are. We are not alone. We are not orphans. We are not lost. As children of God, we are in his family. And when we are in his family, we get to experience all the blessings and the benefits of being his children, which includes eternity with him and to be co-heirs with Christ. This is a lot like in the, in the movie Lion King, if you remember that from your childhood, or perhaps you've watched it with your kids. There's a great scene where uh, Simba in his teenage years, he's kind of run off to an oasis to live the Hakuna Matata life. He wants a life of no worries. He doesn't want to deal with any responsibilities, but he knows deep down within him that it isn't enough. He knows somewhere within him that he was made for more. He was born for more. And so in a moment of sadness, in a weak moment for him, Rafiki shows up in the story and he hits him over the head with a stick and he tells him to look into a pond. And you know the scene, he looks in the pond and what does he see? He sees himself and then it turns into his father. He looks up into the clouds and a voice booms from heaven and it says, remember who you are. 
That's the kind of encouragement that the Spirit of God gives us. The kind of encouragement that is unchanging. The kind of encouragement that is not based off external factors that can come and go, ebb and flow. Instead, it's encouragement based off of an unchanging truth for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. You are a son or a daughter of God. You are loved, you are seen, you are known. The greatest source of encouragement that the Spirit can give us is to remind us exactly who we are. That alone ought to give us just enough to um, go through whatever circumstance we're going through in our life in this moment. But if you've been through Rooted, And I would encourage you that if you haven't, we run Rooted online. I would love for you to consider it as we get closer to the fall. Rooted is a place where we actually, around week five, get to be reminded of our true identity through a bookmark that has so many verses on it. I just want to show you five of these reminders in the Word of God. It says this. It says in John 1.12 that you and I are children of God. I am a child of God. Another part of our identity, God is pleased with how he made me. That's from Genesis 1, 31. I am God's masterpiece. It says that in Ephesians 2, 10. I am a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Christ calls me his friend. John 15, 15. There's power even in this moment for me just reading those truths that all of us are subject to the pain and the struggle that's in this world. But even just saying that here in this moment does something in my own spirit. It's the spirit of God reminding my spirit that I am his, that I am loved, that I am seen, that I am his child, that I can call Christ friend. You see, when you and I are reminded by the Holy Spirit of who we actually are, that's a kind of encouragement that is unchanging. Now, there is another promise in scripture as well. Jesus says, in this life, you will have troubles. That's a promise that you and I don't really want to accept, but it is true. And so what Jesus says is, I will send you another to come with strength and to remind you of who you are. I want to show you one last passage of scripture. This is one of my favorite illustrations in all of God's word. It comes out of John chapter 10, two different sections. It says this, I, this is Jesus's words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Now notice what that passage doesn't say. It doesn't say, That when God gives you his grace and you accept Jesus into your heart, that you are going to be whisked away, removed from all pain and trouble. Not at all. It actually affirms that you are going to continue living in a world where there is evil and things are going to be lurking and prowling, trying to devour you. What an encouragement, right? But the center of that illustration is that God is greater than all and we are in his hand. There's a contrast there of a hired hand who has no ownership and really no deep concern for the sheep. The hired hand runs away at any moment of fear, but it is Jesus who take his sheep into his own hand and he says, I am greater than all. No one will be able to snatch you away. Uh, my family, uh, we used to live on a busy street. And then when I had young kids, 
I would always be afraid of them playing out front and wanting to cross the street to this alley where they could ride bikes and skateboards and stuff. And so my wife and I, all the time, every time the kids would go outside, we would say, don't cross the street alone. And every now and then you would see the kids start to creep out there and cars just whip around these corners way too fast. And it's not that we didn't trust our kids. We just didn't trust the people that were driving too crazy in our neighborhood. And so every single time our kids wanted to cross the street, we would walk up next to them and we would say, take my hand. And then together we would walk across the street. The street did not change. It did not get any less dangerous. There wasn't any less risk of a car coming around that corner, but my children could be safe and secure because they are in their father's hand. Every river that you go down, if you have a river guide, the river doesn't get any less dangerous, but we are given a guide to go with us. This life that you and I have will not be any less dangerous just because you said yes to Jesus. But the promise is that he, through the Holy Spirit, comes to us in strength and we get to be in his hand because we are his. Things may try to get you, but it will be impossible because nothing is greater than God. God's love, God's comfort is unchanging no matter the circumstance. The reason for that is because it's rooted in the unchanging love of God that he has for you. You are his. And so there's a, a practice that I want to introduce you to as we close here today. Um, in some traditions, if you go to a, a retreat center where you are invited to practice and experience the presence of God, you are handed a candle. And this candle is a tangible, physical reminder of something for you. And I don't know if you're like me, but I can sometimes struggle with an invisible God. While I have enough faith to keep following after him, there's times in my life where I just need to be reminded of the ever presence of God, that he is always with me. And so in this practice, you would have a candle and the instructions are actually quite simple. Any time in your life where you feel overwhelmed by the presence of God, you are in a moment of gratitude and you can experience his love being poured out on you, you would take a lighter and you would light that candle. And the candle then becomes a reminder of God with you because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I can then look at this candle and I don't worship the candle. The Holy Spirit isn't the candle himself. It's just a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit around me. And I can worship, I can praise, I can write gratitude and say, thank you, God, for being with me. But also in that practice, there are times when we have to acknowledge that we don't always feel God, that we struggle in our own emotions, we struggle in our own experience to praise him because the circumstance is so painful. Whether it's a circumstance you're going through or a circumstance of a loved one, this candle can also be a reminder for us to drive truth into our hearts. You see, the invitation is to light the candle when you are overwhelmed with the presence of God, but it's also to light the candle when you need to be reminded of the presence of God. And so even in our worst moments, even when you and I have a weakening faith and we are struggling in our isolation and our loneliness, our anxiety or our depression, in our fear and our worry, we can light a candle and we can drive truth into our hearts that the Holy Spirit is with us, that the Holy Spirit is within us. We're gonna take a few moments as we close our service today and I wanna invite you to prayer. What, what really is prayer? Prayer is a chance for you and I to remind ourselves that God loves us, sees us, and knows us. It's to remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit is within us and that the Holy Spirit then gets to remind us that we are children of God. And so right now, if you are able, I would even encourage you, if you have a candle available, go and get it. 
take a second and just hang on to this candle and use it no matter where you are to light it in acknowledgement of, of how good God has been to you or to light it to remind yourself that God is with you right now. And if you have any needs for prayer, we have a team of people who want to pray with you. Prayer is a chance for us as believers to gather together and to remind ourselves of the presence of God. It's actually to enter into the presence of God together. And we have a team who wants to pray with you. And so there's information available so that you can do that right here in this moment. Whatever is going on in your life, wherever you are in a place of need, what I want you to be reminded of here today is that Jesus promised us the Spirit of God to comfort us, to be with us in strength, and to remind us that we are His. So as we close, allow me to pray for you and just take a moment to reflect on the goodness of God in your life. Father God, thank you. God, we acknowledge that right here in this moment, that we may be feeling one of two things. God, some of us are overwhelmed with joy and gratitude because you have been so good. And God, you deserve all of our praise and you deserve all glory. And so God, we light a candle in celebration. But there are others of us, God, who when we think about where we are in life or perhaps where our loved ones are in life, God, we are grieving, we are mourning. We are experiencing loss. And Father, we are desperate to feel you. And so God, we light a candle to be reminded that your Holy Spirit is with us. God, that is truth that we need today. And so Lord, I ask that as we worship and as we sing, that Father, you would make yourself known to us. Holy Spirit, would you interact with our spirit so that we can be reminded that you are with us in strength and that we are yours. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We bless your name. All praise will rise to you. All the worship, all our adoration, it belongs to you. Yeah, yeah. The head that one was crowned in thorns is crowned in glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet and now at his feet we bow oh, yeah. Do it.
spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting. Help me sing by your spirit. As we close our service today, I would love to pray a passage out of Ephesians chapter 3 over you. If you feel comfortable, place your hands out in front of you, just in a posture of receiving God's word today. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.